Hey guys, welcome to the final lecture of the term, of the class. It is uh, it's day 90 on the good old quarantine count up. Uh, well, enough said about that. It's been a pretty long journey here. Uh, it's exam week, it's the middle of exam week. Uh, so this is kind of, like you have almost all your work is done. There's a paper due tomorrow. Some of you won't have to do that paper because you're gonna take a zero for that since you've done all the other stuff. So this is really, this is considered as an epilogue. Uh, I do like to always, at the end of a class, kind of try to bring things together and, and wrap them up and at least sort of uh, get a full view of the territory that we've explored together. And in this case, that I've explored here in my dining room chalkboard uh, at you guys, and we haven't really done it together. Uh, <clears throat> I hope that that has, this has been a uh, usefully educational exercise, even though I, I, I know for sure it has fallen far short of what uh, a college classroom could be like. So I hope it hasn't fallen so far short that it almost uh, wasn't worthwhile at all. Uh, so today, what I'm going to do is wrap up liberalism and its critics. And uh, what I want to do is answer this question. And I actually wrote this down because I'm, it's been a, almost two weeks since I've lectured. I'm, I feel a little rusty already. Um, so liberalism, I'm not going to read the question yet. Liberalism is a set of ideas that together provides a pretty comprehensive set of answers about how should humans construct various domains, the political domain, the economic domain, the social and cultural domain, the uh, international system. Um, liberalism has answers to the way that these domains should be structured. Uh, and they all refer back to the basic primacy of the sovereign individual. And they're, they're are, they are interlocking and uh, they are uh, sort of self-reinforcing, but they can be taken separately. We can look at the political domain, the economic domain, the social and cultural domain, the international system separately and see uh, um, what liberalism does in each of those domains. Uh, and one other thing to note is that liberalism really is the dominant doctrine for how to organize these different domains. It's by far not the only one. Um, but it is definitely by far the dominant one. It's the most used in each of these domains. And, and overall, the liberal discourse about how human beings should organize these different domains of, of human life, uh, that the liberal discourse is the main one. It's, it, it, it's the dominant one. And that is only in the last 150 years that it's been the dominant one. And it's, it's a relatively new doctrine in historical terms. Um, so the question I'm going to look at today, and I think this will help us get both at liberalism and its critics to kind of bring all this stuff together, is what does liberalism do for us in each of these domains, and what does it cost us? So the different domains are the political, the social, cultural, the economic, and the international system. Now, as I say, each of these domains can be treated separately, though the liberal ideas are definitely interlocking and self-reinforcing, uh, and I'll discuss connections, and I'm not going to draw a bunch of arrows, but just know that kind of dividing human life into these four domains is, uh, you know, it's a construction for sure, but it also does represent how it is that political philosophy and uh, social theory uh, can, do treat these different uh, domains. They, 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 they can be treated separately. You could say that political liberalism makes a lot of sense, but uh, economic liberalism doesn't. You could definitely say that liberalism in the interna liberal internationalism does make sense and these other ones don't or vice versa. So they can be detached from each other. So just know that this is kind of a construction. Um, it, I mean, it's definitely a construction, but uh, it is, it is, it's a useful construction and it certainly is a construction that is used in the liberal discourse, uh, and it's also a construction that, while it's largely been a product of the liberal discourse, that is uh, in some ways mirrored by uh, the competing or critical discourses that we've, that we've looked at as well. So what does liberalism do for us in each of these domains, and what does it cost us? I'm just going to put L. <laughs> And 
And the, what it does for us is what liberalism, it's basically those are the, this is the liberal argument. This is the liberal, the, the liberal, here's what we should be doing and here's why, here's what we get. And the cost to us is going to come to be drawn on or drawn from the various critics. Um, so I've treated these in kind of this order, one, two, three, four, and uh, I'm going to go through them in this order, though I'll probably jump around because that's just kind of how I do it. Um, <clears throat> but the, in the political domain, what liberalism does for us is it gives us uh, a democratic system that's rights preserving. And the focus of political liberalism is on defining, enforcing, and manifesting liberty individual rights, and there's a wide variety of, of those, in, those individual rights. But basically, the idea is the political system is there to protect the sovereign individual. Um, and one of the ways in which this connects with social and cultural, this is liberal individualism. That's the, that's the term I've been using, economic, liber, uh, economic liberalism, political liberalism, liberal individualism, and liberal internationalism, if I should put this as well. I don't want to be changing the labels on you at this point in the term. Uh, one of the connections between political liberalism and social cultural liberal individualism is that political liberalism is uh, it, its job, of the political system's job, is to generate a protected sphere of individual liberty, a sphere where individual sovereignty reigns. And that's the, the sphere of social and cultural action. Um, so uh, the job of political liberalism is to essentially establish a world in which people can exercise their individual sovereignty in as large of a sphere as possible. And then it governs the public sphere, the sphere where people conflict with each other, where, where uh, their rights run into each other. It, it, it uh, establishes that domain as one where what goes on in the political system is protecting rights. And democratic is, it's a means to an end. Uh, democracy is a helper system to political liberalism. It's not an end in itself. Liberty is an end in itself in political liberalism, and democracy is seen as uh, a, a necessary means to that end. Not an optional one, a necessary one. And democracy provides us both with internal and external checks on the power of the political system. Because one of the uh, difficulties, one of the challenges, one of the problems, you could say, that happens uh, within liberalism when the rational individual creates or consents to create a political system uh, to deal with the threat that other individuals pose to their rights is that it creates a new and potentially very powerful entity that is itself potentially a new threat. And so one of the things that uh, democracy, or the thing that democracy does for us is it is a check on that power. Democracy also is, uh, can be seen as an emanation because democracy is popular sovereignty. And liberal individualism is individual sovereignty in a protected sphere, in a sphere of liberty. So there's a connection there, and I won't <clears throat> elaborate on that because I elaborated it on uh, early in the course, but just note that democracy connects with liberalism in both of those ways. It's both a means to an end to, to uh, make sure that the, the, new, the political system that's set up by rational individuals to do this, to protect individual sovereignty, doesn't become a new and more fearsome threat than uh, the individuals uh, who might violate their rights. So the political system is a help and a, and a potential uh, enemy. Like it helps because it protects your rights. Individuals, some, you know, if somebody, if somebody steals your car, they have violated your right to property. And the job of the liberal state is to protect you from malefactors, basically. Um, but the state itself can, and uh, often does slip into tyrannizing you by making you do things that actually aren't for just to protect your rights, but are for your own good or to transfer uh, wealth or power to someone else. There are lots of things the state could do other than protecting rights or preserving rights. And so uh, political liberalism is aimed at establishing not just a uh, rights-preserving state, 
but at preserving a rights-preserving only state. And that's actually an important part of political liberalism. Now, I should note, and I've noted this throughout the course, but I, I think this is a great time to, to, to make this reminder, that uh, liberals share a lot of assumptions, a lot of normative uh, um, statements, a lot of shoulds, that's what a normative statement is. They, they certainly share a commitment to uh, giving uh, individual sovereignty is uh, not only a primary place, but as large of a sphere as possible. But uh, there are lots of ways in which liberals disagree with themselves. And within political liberalism, there's for sure, well, okay, what does a rights-preserving only state do? Right? If, we, if we accept the premise that democracy is essential and that limited government is, uh, uh, is also essential, um, what limitations? And also, what kind of democratic system, what democratic processes will actually act most effectively to preserve this role of the state, or to, to prevent the state from becoming more of a threat than it is a help? So there's lots of disagreement as to what it is the state should look like. So liber liberals do not, with capital L, liberals do not have a singular answer to what will the state be doing. They do have a singular answer to what are the boundaries of what the state should be doing. So, and I said this is early in the term, but uh, it definitely merits reminding, uh, American liberals and American conservatives, Democrats and Republicans, the, those two things don't exactly map onto each other, but it's a good proxy for it, um, are all liberals with a capital L. The difference between a small L liberal and a small C conservative is how they think that the uh, democratic limited state should be structured to make sure it does that, right? Um, so there are going to be essentially uh, practical differences. And a large part of the difference comes from what each of these groups of people think are the um, most important threats to protect against. Conservatives think that the most important threat to protect against is the government itself. Liberals think that the most important threat to protect against uh, is uh, domination in the, um, in the uh, economic sphere, corporations or, and wealthy people, uh, as well as uh, domination through the democratic system like, uh, the, of, the, of your civil liberties. So there's a different analysis of how the threat of the state or the threats play out. Um, there's also a difference in uh, what rights are being preserved, which version of liberty, negative or positive, or what balance, how much of each. Conservatives tend to want to uh, lean on the side of negative liberty. Uh, uh, liberals tend to want to lean on the side of positive liberty, and per, uh, positive liberty is where you have to, in order to preserve rights, you actually have to pr provide people with resources. Negative liberty is where, in order to preserve rights, you have to keep uh, en entities, the government, corporations, other people, from, from uh, stopping people from doing what they want, from, direct, from directly exercising their individual sovereignty. So in all these areas, there's, there, there's a lot of disagreement uh, about <clears throat> how to put liberalism into practice in each of these domains, right? Economic liberals all agree that what, the, uh, what we get from, and this is where political, the political system is supposed to provide us, in the economic sphere, what we get is we get free exchange and protection for the accumulation of wealth. And uh, there's two reasons for this. One reason is that these are our rights. This is how, that, that, that in, protect, in preserving our rights, this is what the political system has to do. It has to preserve our right to free exchange and our right to accumulate wealth, property rights and individual uh, uh, exchange. Uh, and free exchange is not the sole dimension of individual sovereignty, but it's a big one, right? The, 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 the right to actually make trades with other people um, that might or might not work out for you, but that you freely choose uh, those trades. The other thing that you allegedly get, and are supposedly get, from these two things, which are, which are the cornerstones of capitalism, is you get a, an efficient and productive efficiency and productivity. That by letting people freely exchange, and by letting wealth accumulate, and by not using uh, social resources, to redistribute, uh, by not using social resources to make people do certain things or to take the accumulation of wealth that happens through the free exchange and redistribute it, that you have, uh, there's more resources available for people to enjoy. So there's greater productivity, there's greater efficiency. That any, inter any interference in the economic system beyond doing these two things, 
uh, is going to be inefficient and it's going to be and it's going to lessen our productivity. So what you get from essentially protecting capitalist rights, that's what these are, these are capitalist rights, is the most productive, the most efficient economic system. So society has the most wealth available uh, possible. Um, so that's the second argument, is that not only are these rights your human rights, essentially, your individual rights, but they also have the beneficial effect that if they are respected, that they will create a productive economic system. Um, now, the, the, there, is a, there is disagreement among economic liberals who agree on all this stuff so far about just how much and what type of government action is necessary to protect free exchange. Now, it, there's less disagreement on what it takes to protect the accumulation of wealth. There, it, that, that's actually, believe it or not, I, you probably do believe it, a simpler question to answer. Well, how do we make sure that, that uh, wealth can be accumulated? Uh, it's just don't engage in redistribution. Don't tax uh, some group of people to be able to transfer wealth to other groups of people. Um, now, because taxation is essential in a liberal state, because the, the rights preserving actions are not, it's not, rights are not self enforcing, and you can't rely on voluntary contributions to do this job. Um, so there's always going to be the question, both in the political and the economic domain, of what tax, what type of taxation, how much taxation, who gets taxed, what kinds of activities. Um, those questions can't be sidestepped in there, and they are extremely important. And so liberals will disagree about what the best way to tax people to pay for these essential functions is. But economic liberals will agree that what you can't use taxation for is anything other than funding the state to make sure it preserves people's rights. You can't tax for other social goals, other economic goals, other political goals. Um, and the, the same thing is true for, uh, the, for liberals in the political domain. Conservatives and liberals will agree because they agree on the capital of liberalism, that the state is supposed to be protecting and preserving rights only. And therefore, the paternal state, the state that makes decisions for us for, in our, own, for our own good, is not legitimate. Um, now, conservatives will sometimes call the actions of liberals or the policies that liberals prefer a, a type of paternalism, and that is that there's political rhetoric there because they're actually saying, hey, you're not actually sticking to the agenda that we we're all supposedly agree on, that the job of the state is to preserve our rights. But usually, uh, liberals will have an answer like, no, that's not a paternalist action. That's actually a necessary thing to protect uh, people's liberty. So like a seatbelt law could be seen as a paternalistic law. It's like it's protecting you from your own stupid decisions not to wear a seatbelt so that when you get into an accident, you hurt yourself. But the argument for seatbelt laws is made that it's, it's a necessary feature to preserve individual sovereignty, not to uh, um, make people uh, live a better or healthier life. Um, so, again, disagreement within the economic uh, realm as to what is, what is necessary, like, especially to, to protect free exchange. Now, again, in this domain, the difference between conservatives and liberals, the difference between people who are uh, far more hardcore laissez-faire is that to them, the state should do very little to protect freedom of exchange and uh, that the bare minimum is necessary. Others recognize that to protect freedom of exchange actually requires a lot because you have to force pe uh, people to reveal information. You have labeling requirements. You have to force fair bargaining situations. You have to create a, a situation where disproportionate bargaining power or, a, or an asymmetric uh, exchange uh, situation, people very rarely come together for an exchange from perfectly symmetric situations, that you actually have to make sure that uh, the conditions under which people come together and make free exchanges are in fact free and not just free looking, free seeming, right? Um, so having just the formal freedom to make an exchange to uh, liberals in the economic uh, domain means that you actually have to make sure that uh, people with less resources and less power have enough resources and power to make sure that their exchanges really are free. And this kind of comes back to the negative and positive liberty again that if you're going to be, if you have no resources whatsoever, and you go to make an exchange, you're going to come to that exchange with a level of desperation that doesn't make your exchange free. Like you freely make it in the sense that no one has a gun to your head, but the world essentially has a gun to your head, metaphorically, not not uh, literally. So uh, conservatives will say, no, we, we're not going to provide too many positive uh, um, resources for that, and liberals will say, no, we need to make sure. So again. 
what, what goes into protecting freedom of exchange? As I say, protecting the accumulation of wealth is actually a simpler thing. It just means that when you tax, that you would not use taxation to transfer uh, wealth, that, you're, that, that uh, you're taxing solely for the purpose of generating revenue to pay for the necessary functions of the state, in other words, the, uh, to make sure free exchange uh, exists. Now again, if you have a more uh, robust version of what the state needs to do, you're gonna do, have to do more taxation, right? If, there's, uh, uh, if, if your version of liberty says, well, positive liberty is really important and we have to, as a society, provide a lot of resources to individuals, when there's a lot of people who don't have those resources, like not everybody can afford to pay for education, so we're gonna have to pay for uh, a free education for every citizen. That's a pretty big endeavor, and that's gonna involve a lot of taxation. Um, so uh, the more resources that a liberal believes people need to have free exchange, to make free exchanges, to have it be truly free, the more taxation there's gonna be, and then that taxation debate becomes that then even more heated as to like, well, we need more revenue, so where's that going to come from? But again, the agreement is that the ultimate purpose and all political debates need to be carried on with this reference point, right? That whatever policies are going, going to be enacted have to refer back to these two things. There, so uh, in both of these cases, what we have is limited government. And uh, what are the boundaries of that limitation is up for dispute. But that this is the, uh, the boundary is not up for dispute. Now, what does this cost us? Uh, it's in both cases, what limited government costs us is the ability to pursue other goals. So in the economic realm, economic liberalism essentially says Efficiency and productivity are the only economic goals that can be served by the state. Now, in an economy, there are multiple goals besides efficiency and productivity. There's equity, security, um, and uh, I always <laughs> I, I forget. Uh, it's funny I haven't taught that particular lecture in a while, so I forget. But there's there are multiple goals that could be pursued um, in uh, uh, in an economy. And economic liberals aren't saying that people can't pursue those. Like, you as a person can pursue equity. You can take your money and freely give it to others and, and redistribute your own wealth, right? It's no economic liberal saying that people, individuals, have to pursue efficiency and productivity at all costs. All they're saying is that the only economic goals the state can pursue and therefore, the, the uh, discourse about policy decisions has to always refer back to these protecting these values. Individuals, companies, organizations are free to pursue other goals. And in fact, they're encouraged to do so. Um, one of the reasons why uh, people are against high taxation of individuals and corporations is uh, they say, well, what that does is that crowds out private giving. So the more I'm taxed, the less I can choose to give my money to a church or a charity or a social movement, or a protest group, uh, you know, a bailout fund um, for protesters. Like, part of the economic liberal idea is that we're gonna create space, I, financial space, for people to, to, and legal space, for people to pursue whatever economic goals they want, but society will only pursue these goals collectively. What that means is that security is not a goal that can be pursued. Equity is not a goal that can be pursued. It might be a secondary effect of the policies that are enacted, but it's not supposed to be the purpose. Um, you could get greater security out of these policies, but you can't be pursuing them. Um, now, it gets blurry a little bit because one of the things that a liberal within the economic uh, domain would say, a small L liberal, is that people need positive uh, resource, people need resources, they need positive liberty to actually have free exchange be the case. So they need a certain level of baseline security to be able to have a free exchange. If you're desperate and, you, and there's no net under you and there's, you have no resources, you're not gonna be making free choices. Uh, not really free choices. They're gonna look like free choices on paper, but there's zero gonna be free choices in, in, in reality. Even there, the idea that security is a necessary condition for free exchange is just saying that what we are doing is not pursuing security as a social goal. 
we're providing a certain level of personal security to make sure that free exchange, that particular capital's right, is preserved. So you can't essentially provide more security than is needed to make sure people have free exchanges. You can't say, well, you know what? Beyond, beyond like baseline security, what we want to do is we want to make people secure. We want everybody in our society to feel comfortable enough that they don't worry about their, their, their health, their well-being, their, their, their financial status, their, their families. Uh, security that goes above and beyond protecting free exchange because that you don't you you don't need all of that in order to be able to make free exchanges so the economic liberal discourse says that you we can't go there if security is going to be provided uh, then it, it has to be a means to an end just like democracy is a means to an end of preserving right democracy is not an end in itself and also in the political domain you through the democratic system the only debates are supposed to be, okay, what policies are necessary to preserve the line of the harm principle? What policies are necessary to protect individual sovereignty in the sphere of liberty? And then there's going to be a lot of debate about where that line goes and what government actions are necessary to make sure that that line is policed correctly and that it isn't crossed. And uh, debate will go into what uh, kinds of uh, policies and uh, uh, institutions and practices are needed in order to make sure the government does, doesn't become more of a threat to its citizens than it is a help to its citizens. And of course, one of the things that we're seeing right now, which is, since I last lectured to you, is you know, widespread protests about a specific way in which the government is actually uh, hurting people, not helping them. Um, or it's hurting a particular segment of the population, colored people, uh, to preserve uh, and it's protecting white people. Um, and so it's actually like, th now there's like, okay, how do we make sure the government actually protects everybody? From a liberal point of view, the government is supposed to protect everybody. And so one of the things about these protests they, they, is that they, they accept the liberal premise that the government ought to be protecting everybody's rights. And what they're pointing out is that, and the government is not. And in fact, the government is the infringer of those rights, right? It's it, uh, that a lot of the violence that's perpetrated that is actually coming not from private citizens doing bad things that the government needs to crack down on, but from the, from the state itself. Um, so there's the, there, there, of course, will be controversies about well, what systems are needed to make sure that the government is uh, not a threat, but is only a help, or is a threat as little as possible and is a, is a help to, the, to all people. Um, but there is, again, the presumption that the job of the state is to preserve rights. What you can't do is you can't, within the liberal discourse, you can't argue for a policy without referring back to how it preserves people's rights. You can't say that what we want to do as a society is we want to provide a cohesive, unified, national culture. Um, and that would impinge on this. But that's, that's, that is a goal that can't be pursued. You, you can't pursue goals that don't refer back to the preservation of rights for the sovereign individual. Um, and as we saw in, 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 uh, from a number of the critics, that actually cuts off citizens from a lot of what a democratic system could do and a lot of what people might want a democratic system to do. The same thing uh, with economic liberalism. It cuts off the political system from achieving goals like equity that, or security that a lot of people might actually want. Um, and, you know, another one is like uh, another economic goal, or actually this might be a social goal, is like it, you know, environmental protection. Right? Basically, when, if you're going to protect the environment, you're going to have to refer to it as like protecting people, preserving people's rights, not we have a stewardship of the earth and we have to set policies that actually make us good stewards. That is a goal that is not available in the liberal discourse. And this particular one is actually problematic to uh, people living in liberal societies. They're like, with the, with the limited government constraint on what the democratic system is supposed to be doing, we can't actually preserve our ability to live on this planet. We can't be good stewards. We can't uh, essentially accept that animals and trees and, and oceans have the right, they have the right to persist in, survive and be healthy, the only rights holders are human beings. <clears throat> and so for environmentalists who want to see essentially rights be protected beyond the human domain, economic or political liberalism prevents that goal from being pursued. Now, a big part of sort of the background of this is that it's what holds this up. There's no fence that liberals enact. What holds this up is the nature of the liberal discourse. 
the liberal discourse says, Here are, here's how you have to argue about what policies we're going to put in place. Here's, you can't do it this way. Obviously, people are going to not abide by the rules of the discourse. But um, with liberalism being the dominant like, mindset, not just the dominant set of political philosophies, but the dominant mindset, the people who are trying to add different concepts, different goals to the political or economic discourse are marginalized right off the bat. And so they actually, their task is not just to convince other people to support their policies. Their task is first to convince uh, people who believe in liberalism that uh, the government, the democratic government, ought to be capable of expanding its portfolio of policies. Uh, and to the extent that that is not possible to do, or that, it's, that, it, that it faces huge obstacles, cult, like politically, political culture obstacles, just the willingness to listen to somebody who says uh, that you know, uh, oceans actually have rights just like individuals and we should actually be uh, preserving those rights. Like the, 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 liberal dis the power of the liberal discourse is that that voice isn't going to get really much of a listen in the political arena. So the, what polices this limited government is the liberal discourse that as its backdrop assumption is rights preserving only, right? It's the only part that's really uh, important. Now, over here in the uh, sphere of liberty for the in individual sovereign, this is the public-private split, right? And there's a similar cost. The cost is that whatever power structures exist within the private sphere, the only way to dismantle those power structures is with private action. Public power cannot be used to dismantle power structures within that private sphere because that is, that is where the government doesn't get to go. Right? The policing of this boundary, right? So the biggest cost is the ability to, to pursue other goals, and for here, the other goal, okay, cannot pursue, cannot dismantle private sphere power structures. <clears throat> and the, 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 the feminist critique of, of political and, or liberal individualism and of political liberalism really hits on this, but fem, the feminist critique is not the only one that makes this same point, right? There are all kinds of ways to say, well, there, there are power structures in uh, the private sphere. Clearly, there are power structures in the public sphere, right? Um, but there are also power structures in the private sphere, particularly in the home, and by immunizing the private sphere from public action, uh, what liberalism is doing is uh, cutting off movements from using the public forum to advance their goals of, 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 of equity, of greater, of greater equality, of, of dismantling power, of creating a, a more horizontal power structure rather than a vertical power structure. You can, you can do it, but you can't do it through the public forum. And when you can't do it through the public forum, that's basically making it not impossible, but way, way harder to dismantle those private uh, power structures. So. Um, Basically, in these three areas, limited government focused on being the rights preserving only uh, state takes an entire sphere of action, to enti excuse me, to, takes an entire sphere of uh, life, the, the, the democratic political system, the public forum, and uh, hems it in and says only certain goals can be pursued within this sphere, and all other goals don't belong here. And that is that is, from numerous critics that we've seen, uh, have a problem with the way that liberalism essentially says, yeah, certain policies and goals can come on in, and we can discuss them, we can argue about them, and we can enact some version of them. Other ones don't even get to come in the door, right? Um, and that is, that is the biggest cost, right? What does liberalism cost us? Liberalism costs us the, a full, robust, multidimensional public sphere. Um, or public forum, or democratic system. Uh, democratic action is not allowed to pursue community goals. It's not allowed to pursue uh, cultural unity, it's not, or cu cultural uniformity. It's not allowed to pursue, uh, you know, uh, uh, greater stewardship of the earth. There, there are, you know, some of these goals you might be like, yeah, those are bad. Like, we don't want cultural unity, um, but we do want better stewardship. And other people might be like, we don't need better stewardship, but we want cultural unity. Uh, 
it doesn't matter because liberalism says none of those things are allowed in. And of course, people sneak in to the public forum, or they don't sneak in, but they bust in. Um, but the backdrop of the liberal discourse, our political culture's acceptance of this limitation primarily, it means that those voices asking for more, asking to pursue other goals, are not going to be heeded. Um, now, in the liberal international system, um, the, the idea is that uh, there should be a cooperative, what we get is a cooperative international system. And the idea here is that what that does is that brings us peace and prosperity, right? It, it, it actually gets us the things that the political system gets us, peace, we avoid conflict, and prosperity. Um, but uh, the premise here also is that um, without a cooperative international environment, um, we can still have all the rest of these, right? We can still have a system, a, universe, a, a, a global system of liberal political systems that abide by limited government, yet if they, they themselves don't add that extra layer of cooperation, there's going to be unnecessary conflict. So this one really kind of belongs off by itself, and as I indicated in that lecture, it is the sort of the newer one. So it can be bracketed. The rest of these are sort of, the, uh, these other three are, are really more tied together. What the liberal international system costs us is a certain loss in uh, national sovereignty. And this is one of the criticisms of, of liberal internationalism. Uh, and, and you know, Donald Trump and the, the Trump foreign policy, the approach, America first pr approach, is only one variant of the criticism that liberal internationalism costs us uh, national sovereignty. So the cost is national sovereignty. Because what you do is you enmesh nation states in this cooperative scheme of interlocking institutions that they, that have their own rules and norms and that require states to do things that maybe their democratic system d doesn't want to do. And uh, that does bristle, particularly for a vibrant democracy, right? If you have a vibrant democratic system where you elect your leaders and you tell your leaders that what you want to do is you want to not provide a bunch of foreign aid, but you're involved in these, these organizations where you're paying a ton of money uh, to your, your allies or to the World Health Organization or to the United Nations, to the World Bank, and through the democratic system, uh, the, the domestic democratic system, the people exercising the popular sovereignty say, we don't think that preserves our rights and we don't want to do that. Um, the liberal international system makes that hard to do. Obviously not impossible. And it's the, this is the one, it's the newest, it's also the easiest one to sort of, I would say, both resist and or dismantle. So overall, what does liberalism do for us and what does it cost us? Well. What it does for us is it carves out a very strongly protected sphere of individual liberty. What it does for us is it respects our individual sovereignty. It values our ability to conceive of our own conception of the good, form our own conception of the good, and pursue it however we see fit, as long as we don't harm other people. Well, uh, it, pr it produces... Uh, a high level of productivity, it produces a rights-preserving situation, so we're not unsure if our rights are actually going to be protected or not, at least, you know, th that's the theory. A lot of people don't feel as though the state protects them, and, the, and it's because of, of a failure to actually hit this, essentially, benchmark of what political liberalism says, right? When you have a racially unequal uh, criminal justice system, that is failing to reach the benchmark of political liberalism. And you can criticize that with, within liberal terms, right? So liberalism has its internal critics who are basically what we can think of as ombudsmen, who, people who are like looking from the inside at whether or not the system is adhering to its own values, right? But, so that's what we get. But what we give up is we give up a broader, more multidimensional, more robust public forum. Um, and, uh, like, do we get, we get, get something valuable, and we give up something valuable. What's the balance? What's the, like, you know, I hate to use the economic terms, but like, what's the cost benefit? Do we get more benefits than we're costs? Like, we, we, know we're, we know it's costing us, but what's the relative value of the benefit and the cost? Um, and I wish I could answer that question, because then I would be the new John Rawls of the 21st century, but uh, the real answer is, that's actually one of the fundamental terms of debate about liberalism itself. Is it worth the cost? Is the thing that we get more valuable than the things that we give up? And it depends on how strong you value individual sovereignty. It depends on whether or not you believe uh, 
and your society believes that respecting uh, individual choice within the, within the sphere of, uh, where you don't harm other people, it, should that be the primary value that when there are conflicts between that and say equity or stewardship of the earth uh, or um, uh, uh, security, that when there are conflicts between those two, the pro-liberals say individual sovereignty has to win and these other things have to lose, uh, and critics say these other values actually should be more important. So it ultimately, whether you're a liberal or a critic, um, is, uh, comes down to do you think the individual sovereign and the respect for the individual, the sovereign individual I should say, do you think that respect for the sovereign individual is the top value that doesn't give way when there are conflicts? Or do you think that there are other values that ought to win out when there's a conflict with respecting the sovereign individual? So that's what it comes down to, and that's uh, what this whole course has been about, is exploring the sort of more fine-grained nature of those various, uh, of, that, of that particular conflict. Um, all right, well, I think that does it. And uh, that, to me, satisfy, it's, it's a satisfactory wrap-up of what I've hoped that this course has been all about. It's been about a tour of what liberalism will do for us, why, and what it's costing us, and giving you a chance to decide, like, do you think that on balance, liberalism gives us more than it takes from us? Or do you think that on balance, liberalism takes more from us than it gives? Um, if you believe that liberalism gives us more than it takes, then you are in the dominant view, because liberalism is the dominant uh, political view in the world today. If you uh, think it ta takes away more from us than it gives us, or it takes away something that's important, uh, uh, that's essential, that ought to be primary, then you are a person who, ha who is, if you want to be a political activist, who's going to have to be attacking the dominant discourse and attacking in, I, I say that not like it doesn't have to be a violent physical attack, it doesn't have, that what you, I, maybe the better word is undermining. Um, and remember, liberalism was once the underdog. It was once the new kid on the block. It was once uh, a kind of marginal uh, um, uh, political viewpoint. And it, you know, within a century and a half from its birth, became the dominant discourse. Uh, so, and it can seem very much like that's just the nature of the universe, um, and the nature of the human, the human world anyway, and that it's, it's inevitable, right? Liberalism is an inevitable thing, and whatever the costs are, that's just the cost of doing business of being uh, a, a human being. But it, it's not. But it, it is definitely the status quo, and to, uh, to side with the critics is to side with the need to change the status quo, and status, the status quo has an awful lot of weight uh, to it. And uh, that's, yeah, that's actually probably the best place for me to end. So I really appreciate all of you sticking all the way through this prologue and this whole course and, and, and you know, dealing with the struggles and hardships that I know have been uh, part of this whole remote instruction uh, uh, model, as well as then the last couple weeks where the world has gotten even more tumultuous and uncertain and uh, distracting in terms of like, they're big, big distractions, not just like, oh, I was, I was Netflix binging and I couldn't do my work because I just didn't have any motivation. It's like, no, I was actually paying attention to this really important political struggle that's going on and I was also contributing to it and like, yeah. So I really appreciate that you've gotten all this way and maybe you haven't done the work of this class to, to the level that you normally would do that do work because of these big reasons. And I totally understand that as well. And, and you should have compassion for yourself for not having, if, if you didn't live up to your own academic standards, please have compassion for yourself. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I've tried to have compassion for myself that I'm like, I'm falling short of giving the full educational experience that I really want to give. It's like, well, just go easy on yourself. All right, well, that's it. I really appreciate it. And I'll probably see some of you this summer term. All right, bye.